Farming. It's the oldest industry on earth and arguably the most important. It feeds the world, employs millions, sustains life. And it's under siege. Agriculture consumes 70% of the world's water, its most precious resource. A single almond the size of a thumbprint requires just over a gallon to reach maturity. Put another way, that water that California uses in a single year just to grow almonds is enough to serve all the homes and businesses in the greater Los Angeles area for nearly three years. Farmers rely on diverse data and generations of accumulated experience to do what they do. But farming is still farming and operating margins are slim. The oldest industry on earth also has the oldest challenge. Consume less, produce more. The data that empowers 21st century farming pours in from sensors in the ground that measure moisture content, from water volume monitors deep in the aquifer, from weather stations, and from generations of experience and knowledge. But here's the challenge. How can all that data become a single, meaningful, real-time indicator of how the crop is doing? Well, there is a solution. Imagine that you're a vineyard operator with the ability to log into a mobile app to see contextualized data from thousands of sensors telling you everything that's happening in your vineyard in real time from anywhere in the world. That same app helps you anticipate and respond to equipment failures before they occur through rich predictive insight and provides detailed information about the vineyard's microclimate. Imagine receiving requests for water directly from the plants and having a system that can automatically respond or being able to focus specifically on one row of vines or on the data from a single plant. Imagine being able to view and analyze the color of the grapes on that plant or the ratio of the sun above the canopy to the shade below it. This is precision agriculture. This is NEO. We combine millions of unrelated complex data points and convert them into a simple, visual, richly insightful experience. And the result? Lower cost and resource consumption, higher crop yields, and better product quality. Precision agriculture is a game changer for farming. When experience combines with real-time data collected at the plants themselves, we redefine the world's oldest and most revered industry. And that is only the beginning. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. A lot of you will remember Steve Case, who among other things founded America Online many years ago. According to Steve, we're now entering what he likes to call the third wave of the internet. And during the first wave, companies like AOL laid the foundation for consumers to connect to the internet. They were essentially the catalysts of connectivity. During the second wave, companies like Google and Facebook built applications on top of the first wave's foundation. This is a period of tremendous application development. But today, as the third wave begins, entrepreneurial companies like Neo Labs are transforming entire economic sectors like food, water, health, transportation, and education. These companies use the broadband and mobility enhanced internet to create ecosystems unlike anything we have ever seen before. And that is why we're here. Perhaps the single greatest human challenge that we face, perhaps even more important than access to healthcare, is the ability to feed the world and to provide every individual with access to fresh water. If we do that, we can indeed fundamentally change the world. So for the next hour, I ask you to imagine a world where that challenge doesn't exist. Can it be done? Yes, it can, and we're going to show you how. Just over two years ago, in a webinar like this one, with great attendance and a lot of post-event follow-up, we openly shared our vision and our plan for NEO to digitize agriculture. Today we're sharing again, but this time our focus is on the results, the lessons learned, and some pretty exciting next steps as NEO Labs moves towards scaling within the agriculture and water management sectors. I'm Steve Shepard, and I'll be your host and provocateur for this webinar. I'm an author and a consulting analyst, and I've been watching NEO evolve pretty much since day one, actually before day one now that I think about it, what you're gonna see and hear today is pretty remarkable. So let me introduce Doug Stanley, the founder of Neo Labs, and Phil Asmundson, the owner and operator of Deep Sky Vineyard. Welcome, gentlemen. Hi, Steve. So let's start with the farmer, and Phil, I have to tell you, it's still difficult for me to think of you as a farmer, but let's start with a farmer who took the technological leap of faith. 
if I remember correctly, this all got started because you and Kim were frustrated and more than a little bit annoyed about having to drive 100 miles back and forth to the vineyard just to see if the water had been turned on or off. I think it's probably safe to say that you've come a long way since that time. Um, yes, Steve, we really have. And, and uh, let me quickly introduce myself. Phil Asmundson and my wife Kim and I are the owners of Deep Sky Vineyard. Um, just by way of background and full disclosure, I was a partner at Deloitte & Touche uh, before I retired in 2014. And I led the technology media and telecom. So a jump into technology wasn't the, the most unusual thing for me. The jump into wineries were um, for my 50th birthday, I went to Argentina and my wife and I bought a small vineyard, and somehow that translated into we should buy 20 acres in Wilcox, Arizona, uh, and start to plant up in uh, um, uh, the Arizona area, mostly because they're very similar. They're both at 33 degrees uh, north and south of the equator. But the question begs, where is Wilcox, Arizona? And uh, it is a two-hour drive for us one way, so four hours in total, and I think you'll get a sense as Google Earth is going to take us down to see a very remote corner of southeast um, Arizona. Uh, the town of Wilcox itself is about 3,700 people. It's an old uh, 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 cowboy town. Um, the vineyards are about 20 miles south there, about 40 miles from uh, the Mexican border. And that is where about 80% of the grapes are grown in the state of Arizona, uh, principally because it's at about 4,200 feet above sea level. So it's much cooler than the temperatures you'll see on the news that comes up um, uh, around how hot it is in Arizona. Um, you know, Steve, you were right. Our challenge began with a simple on and off, and you're now starting to see us come into that vineyard. So I'll, I'll give you a little idea. The little red dot is uh, us. There's a vineyard right next to us, but just above us, you saw some round circles. That was an old vineyard called Crop Circle. They actually planted the vineyards in a circle, <laughs> and it still exists today. The guy who bought it has done a remarkable job straightening rows that were once in circles. So hats off to him. Um, but we did start with an on-off, but we quickly realized it was more. Um, as we got a little bit smarter about farming, we wanted to know why we were turning a zone on. We wanted to know when should it be turned on, and we wanted to know how much should we apply. And these are the questions that Neo Labs has really helped us uh, answer. Uh, with, with their help, we now have solid answers to that. And I think we're going to do a demo now. And uh, if I could ask uh, the, the Neo Lab guys, we're in different locations, but... Um, I'm going to have them go into the system and turn on zone eight for, oh, call it two gallons per vine. Um, the vines are starting to go towards dormancy now, so they're not drinking that much. But that's where you'll get a chance to watch in real time um, how this goes. And just kind of a little backstory as they're going uh, through through the system uh, to give you an idea how far away I've turned this on. We were on an exploratory cruise up in College Fjord, Alaska. In 2017, my wife and I, and uh, we're about 10 minutes away from jumping into Zodiacs to go take a close look at the Harvard Glacier, which was about a half a mile away. And literally, with just a few clicks and fortunately a satellite connection, um, we basically answered that why, when, and how much and scheduled five zones for irrigation. And you'll see them going through and doing that right now. Um, the little blue uh, 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 raindrop there uh, next to that is indicating that we're now running zone eight, which is a Viognier and can always use a little bit more water. It's one that tends to be relatively thirsty. I think throughout the webinar, uh, we'll be coming back to this uh, to take a look and check on the status of what's going on. But I think that gives you a quick, quick idea about how simple this is to do. Great, Phil. Thank you very much. Doug, why don't you uh, say a few words of introduction? Sure. Thank you. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. You know, not to expand uh, and go too deep too quick, but it's really very simple. We created NEO to enable users to apply computation as, as easily as we can imagine, but really do it on their terms. So throughout this webinar, we're going to be constantly re, uh, reaffirming our goal, which is to remove the friction and the complexity of applying connected things, whatever term you prefer. I tend to prefer anything but IoT, but <laughs> it seems to be popular today. So throughout the session, we'll be talking uh, a lot about our efforts to build a true platform that enables users to, to imagine and deploy connected solutions really on their own terms. I'd be really remiss if I didn't thank our team. Uh, we've done an amazing job. It's uh, it's it's. Uh, it's funny, we were inside Google's booth at IoT World and it really struck us for three solid days throughout this conference with thousands of people, I think there were 12,000 people, 
the thing that we heard constantly was people challenging us, is this really real? We were showcasing Deep Sky Vineyard. And it seemed so odd to us that, that people would be so fascinated, like, is this really real? But the whole adoption of IoT, frankly, is still very, very, very nascent, very early. Lots of pilots, lots of prototypes. But yet we've been installing and learning and experimenting at Deep Sky Vineyard now for over two years. So, so this is really a pleasure to come full circle and, and truly talk about results. You know, I do thank uh, Kim and Phil for taking the leap of faith. Look at the bottom line, as Steve mentioned, this is really a calling. Um, I don't want to get too much on a soapbox, but, you know, our planet needs technology. Our planet needs our focus. Um, and um, we are really trying to do our part here. And we'll be sharing the results of some of the amazing results we've gotten by just making the effort of applying technology to truly a societal challenge. So, um, you know, with that, Steve, I'd love to hand it back to you. That's great, Doug. Actually, while I've got you on the phone, because as, as Phil said, we're kind of all in different places today. Why don't you take us on a quick tour of the actual user experience that Deep Sky, uh, you know, sees on a regular basis, and then we'll then we'll get into those results you were talking about. Sure. And from our website, there's an abridged version of this. Uh, we, you know, the, the Asmussen's aren't comfortable enough to allow you to go in and modify their vineyard. So there is a read-only version that has some limitations. Um, so you can also explore on your own. And it's all real, by the way. It's, it's just a read-time version. So we open with a dashboard, uh, clearly, which gives uh, the Asmussen's and their, and their help, you know, an overview of the vineyard, what's going on. We immediately jump into irrigation. And, uh, you know, irrigation is a full story allowing them to set, allowing to, them to evaluate NEO uh, recommendations. But uh, you'll also see in the center the ability really to tune their expectations or their thresholds. So behind the scenes, NEO's taking care of a lot of complexity here. But for the Asmonsons, it's simply moving a line up or down. And we'll expand on this a little bit more as we go. And, of course, we go to the, to the holy grail of weather. Um, now, uh, there is no way that you can listen to your broad weather forecast and understand us what's happening in a vineyard. <laughs> that is impossible. So we do both macro and micro weather. Uh, micro weather even down into leaf moisture. And again, we'll be expanding and we'll field any questions you have on this. Um, we've learned an awful lot about weather and the implications of weather. We have a lot more to learn, but we'll, we'll be sharing more of that. And, and particularly most recently, uh, Phil and team have really started to understand the dynamics of rain um, and the implications below the ground on rain. So we're excited about coming back to that. We give them a full connected diagnostic of the vineyard. Uh, you can see we have a pump on right now. Um, we can look at uh, chemical deployment and then we can look at well as thing on, on a zone basis. And again, you see in zone eight the water on and you see the performance on a gallon per minute basis. Um, we we uh, have been experimenting with scouting. Um, later in the session, we'll talk more about ways that we feel we can continue to remove the user friction. Our current method, uh, they go through a mobile device um, and it's a preset script. Um, but taking whether it's the art or of agriculture or farming art or the worker observations, we're going to work really hard in 2019 to continue to attack the, uh, the user adoption challenge. We give them an overall event log. Everything that's happened in the vineyard, they can see that chronologically. Um, then we dropped in uh, into a report section where Phil can um, do uh, data manipulation and download CSV files. And then, of course, we have an analytics section, which are the actual results. These are things we'll be coming back to in more detail later. Lastly, I want to click on the system view. Um, there's a lot going on in this vineyard, and this is available to you through the read-only site. Um, but this is every sensor in real time reporting, and um, we get a lot of questions around, you know, the types of things we can work with. We'll expand on that later, but frankly, NEO doesn't have any limitations. We are really agnostic to the input. Uh, it's a little bit hard for people to grok in this proprietary technology uh, era that we're in. But um, So that's a real quick flyby. Um, don't worry about it. There's not a test, and Steve, let me pass it back to you, and I'll, we'll, we'll continue on. Okay, thanks. And, and actually, Doug, uh, kind of building on that, and this is really for you and Phil both. Phil, I mean, in spite of all the complexity that Doug just described that we'll talk about later on, your actual routine in the morning is, is fairly simple, isn't it, to get things kicked off? 
Yeah, pretty much. It's about a ten-minute routine. I just I just check check all the information on zones from what percent of FC are they at, how much did they 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 take up in uh, water in the last twenty-four hours, and I look at the recommendations for gallons provide uh, a, a provide uh, that uh, Neo calculates, and with that we make our call and we. We, we start some irrigations, but, you know, the thing that you don't see often is um, if there's a, you could see on one of those slides, there was a big bubble that was showing uh, the, the gallons per minute that was going in. If there's a T-line break that goes too high, we get notified that there's a problem. That's and so, you know, you know, it's constantly monitoring it and, and telling us what's happened or a solenoid doesn't close. Um, those, those are things that do happen on, on a regular basis in the vineyard. So it's, it really helps us not only do something, but then helps us stop something when we need to. Absolutely. And of course, the other thing is you're not getting in your car and driving 100 miles to find out what was broken, which is another yeah. wonderful ad. Yeah. Yeah. There's so, already enough carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Okay. So, so gentlemen, for the last couple of years, three years, I guess, you two have worked together using Deep Sky as sort of a test bed for NEO's digital agriculture platform. Doug, why don't you walk us through some of the quantitative results that you've seen as a result of that? Yeah, and I'll take you back to two years ago when we launched the platform. We really had a just a, a shocking reaction to it. We had from government agencies to water bureaus to farmers to managers to vineyard managers, and, and, and frankly, we were really very tempted to dive in, uh, you know, all in at that point. But, but in reality, we didn't know what we didn't know. And, and frankly, we didn't know what the results would be. We, we had a really strong feeling of the results. So I'm really very pleased. Uh, we put this together and shared this at Google Next 18 not too long ago at Moscone. And, and so the results are just, are just really very telling. 30% um, on labor. Um, you know, and the whole remote access aspect, you know, the fact that the vine that from home, they have a real time awareness of what's happening in the vineyard all the time. You know, it comes down to water, 1.6 million gallons of water saved uh, in one year, year over year, that's over 100,000 acres, 100,000 uh, gallons per acre. Um, you know, for every gallon used is a gallon is there's a use of energy. Um, in fact, I won't bore you with the stats, but years ago we did a project around fluid motion and the movement of fluid is, is the, it uses 10% of the world's energy. So if we can conserve fluid, fluid uh, use and fluid motion, of course, we, we have a, a, a side effect, which is we're saving energy. Um, lots of crop efficiency benefits and overall the ability for the asthma since the razor price. Now we have some things that are a little less measurable. Um, you know, when we started this project, the Asmussen's were in their third year, I believe, of owning the vineyard. Um, just the whole ability for them to make more forecasted capital planning decisions on what they want to do with their vineyard investment and vineyard operation. Clearly an enhancement to the brand, which I'll let, which I'll let Phil expand on in his recent vineyard designate uh, acknowledgement. 100% uh, confidence. Frankly, uh, when the vineyard was disconnected, we, they just, we just didn't know. It was all up to human error. And frankly, this isn't, a, this isn't an asthma issue. I've had very noted um, uh, name brand vineyard managers tell me that I go to bed every night, I'm quoting them, paraphrasing them, is that I wonder, did we turn the water on? Um, and bottom line is just the ability to attack the human error. So we, we can't tie specific percentages or numbers to that, but, but certainly they're significant. Interesting. So, Doug, would it be fair for me to ask, um, from this data, what would you consider to be some of the most important lessons that you learned or gleaned from it? Sure. Um, I can tell you one thing. We, we moved into industrial straight from doing uh, deep, deep. We moved into agriculture straight from industrial. Um, without a doubt, connecting a farm is a hell of a lot harder than connecting a factory. Um, let's be sure. The whole IoT craze has moved very quickly to an instrumented industry, which is industrial. Um, you know, and um, you know, compared to industrial ag, is is just leaps and bounds more difficult. Um, um, one thing we've noticed about an industry scale wide, irrespective not just for ag um, industry wide, is the IoT hardware sector is really immature. Um, so. And I do think that that's, that's, that's really, really uh, challenging the progress that the entire IoT market is, is making. People are effectively trying to sell servers and move them throughout and call them edge devices. So a lot of work needs to be done there. 
um, the entire ag tech sector seems to be really just focused on capturing data, capture data, capture data. They're not answering the question, now, what do we do with this data? How do we empower the users with this data? And, and oh, by the way, they really are promoting store everything, which of course is a feature of NEO. The storage of data is completely uh, an option. Lots of proprietary, narrow proprietary applications. Um, very narrow functional point solutions that do very tiny things, which create, again, a challenge to the farmer. How many narrow things can you use? And then lots of talk about collaboration, but frankly, <laughs> I think it's, you know, I hate to say this, it's a lot more talk than it is reality. People want to collaborate as long as you do things their way. That's not collaboration. So as we think about moving to the ag market, Steve, we really have to address these things hard. And you're going to hear me expand on that, um, you know, later on. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. So, Phil, we've heard about the sort of quantitative results. Let's turn to you and hear a little bit more about the qualitative stuff, if you would. Yeah, sure. Um, we have learned an awful lot uh, by NEO, as, as, as Doug just said. And it gets down to really knowing that each zone is different from the other. So first is water dynamics by zone. Um, but what I mean by that is we know how water penetrates the soil. We know how it percolates through it. We know what the saturation point and field capacity is at all six depths of interest. Um, that way, we're able to really predict exactly what an irrigation is going to do. So that's, that's kind of rule number one, and that's what leads to that second point, plus or minus 1% irrigation precision. Because we know all of that, uh, we're, we're really able to, if we don't want to water it all the way up to 100%, and only watered up to 95% of field capacity, which is the maximum amount that that that, that soil can hold against gravity. Um, we're able to do that, and 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 uh, we do that at different times of the year because we're trying to stress plants at different times of the growing season or relieve stress at different time times of the grow growing season. This third bullet, I can't under stress its importance, and that's the absolute knowledge of vine uptake. This was why we were able to save all that water. We were doing much larger gallon per provide waterings uh, in prior years uh, at the recommendation of our vineyard uh, 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 consultant. Um, the reality is the vines drink at the shallower depths. They drink more at 4, 8, and 16 inches. Some zones only drink at 4 and 8. Um, and when I say only, that, that's about 95% plus of the uptake that they will do. It makes sense. The water is dripped on the topsoil and it drips down. Um, plants figure this out pretty quickly. So they develop their feeder roots, which suck in the water at those shallower depths. We know what that is. And we know with precision the amount that, is drank, uh, that they're drinking from each, each one of those depths. That gets us that fourth bullet, uh, vine, vine precision by growth stage. Kind of mentioned it. There are certain times, like when it sets its fruit, that's, that's when it's going from flower to these little, little tiny green, green berries. Uh, because we stressed it, um, maybe overstressed it a little bit at that time, we were able to set much, much smaller berries. Um, and that has a significant uh, outcome on, on the quality of wine. And there's really little to no downtime here. And as I mentioned before, if something happens like, uh, like we have a tea line break, um, Neo is able to tell us about that as well. So really something that, that not just from afar, but even when we're there, it adds so much more insight to what's happening because we're looking at what's happening under our feet. Right, right. So the, the big data becomes big insight, which is really where the money where the money play is. I mean, I, I want to go back to the numbers here. I mean, this is pretty extraordinary. We're talking about 100,000 gallons, say, per acre just on your little vineyard. That's you know, over a million and a half gallons just this year alone, which is, I mean, truly remarkable on so many different levels. So, I mean, I, you think about this and you think about, you know, the, the possibilities that exist for this. I guess I would ask you and Doug to, to add any other commentary here about this. I, th I think this is just extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, there's well, a couple of, all, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Phil. Go ahead, Doug. Okay, yeah, so there's a, um, you know, first, I point out that we're in Arizona where we have about 5,000, 5, uh, excuse me, um, 5,000 degree days of growing. Uh, that's, that's a measure of what was your highest temperature of the day, minus 50. Um, that's about 60% higher than like a Napa. Um, and wow. so when you look at that, we use less than, point, you know, you know, we, 80% of, of, of an acre foot of water, which is remarkable when you consider crops like corn and others use, you know, in the four, five, and six acre feet of water. Uh, and so if you can do this in Arizona, you can do this anywhere. Yeah, and I guess I'll add that, that this, isn't a, this isn't a deep sky vineyard phenomenon here. I mean, there's a, there are known stats in agriculture about the misuse of water, you know, estimates of 60 plus percent of water wasted. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
And of course, the stat during the water crisis in California, which is, to me is always a water crisis in California, that that uh, that 60 plus percent of the water, 70 plus percent of the water used to grow an almond is wasted. Right? That's those staggering. But but just recently, I'm going to keep the I'm going to keep the the uh, the person anonymous on this, but. Uh, throughout our cycle at Deep Sky Vineyard, we have consultants at Napa that have been working very, very closely in validating, you know, what the Asmonds have been doing in, in Arizona. And recently, uh, one particular gentleman and I had a conversation around climate change. There was a great article around what's going on in Italy. And, uh, and I'm, again, I'm not trying to get on a soapbox. I, for one, am a believer in climate change. But but the perspective that really hit me this week, he says, look, at climate change is, is very real. As a scientist, I get it. I believe it. I follow it. He goes, but the bottom line, what I lay awake at night and wonder is, where am I going to get water? Right? Where am I going to get water from? So the call to action here is, is screaming at the entire uh, agriculture community. And I think it's going to continue to increase. We did one little stat. We did an extrapolation for Google Next, where if we took just a tiny, tiny fraction of just the viticulture market worldwide, 10%, and we got 50% of the results that we're getting at Deep Sky Vineyard in the middle of the desert of Arizona, we're literally talking close to 200 billion gallons of water per year saved, right? So... So what I hope that the folks on the call that are not necessarily in the vineyard business or ag business, but they're in the tech business, that the call to action here is that we really got to get our act together around deploying these distributed connected systems, um, you know, in, and in the collaboration. And again, I'll expand on that. But massive, massive, massive results from very, very, very little adoption. Interesting. So, Phil, beyond the quantitative results and, you know, what you're interested in, I mean, what, what would you consider to be, you know, that which most excites you about what's going on at Deep Sky right now? Um, boy, right now is, is really all about the quality of our fruit. And we've seen it uh, across the board since, since working with Neo. Um, we've gone, you want to, everyone knows about the heat in Arizona. Not a lot of people know about the monsoons, which are nice enough to hit right during the middle of the growing season. That contributes to something called botrytis or bunch rot. Um, but because we're using Neo and we're growing differently, we're hanging our clusters more more loosely than the past. Um, so we have virtually no bunch rot. Um, we had terrible shrivel in our Grenache because we weren't watering it correctly. Uh, literally 30 plus percent of our fruit we were dropping on the ground. We had none this year. Uh, we're ripening our fruit at a lower bricks level. So um, that means uh, we, we, we have a less high alcohol level, but it also means we get to take it off uh, prior to some of the monsoons that come in later in the season that affect our ability to even pick, pick the fruit. And as I mentioned before, we significantly impacted our size of our berries. I would say our berries in 18 were, were only about uh, 20, they're about 25% smaller. Now that increase, that decreases our, our quantity, but the quality, it, I've tasted out of the barrels of 18 already, and it, it's an entirely different wine, in my opinion, from what it has been in the past, because we're, we know what we're doing, we have a strategy of what we're doing, and we're able to make sure we're sticking to that strategy. Interesting. So this may sound like an obvious question, but how has this changed the way you run the business? Well, um, you know, we, we opened up a tasting room about a year and a half ago now. And so uh, before that, we, we sold more grapes than we kept. Uh, we're very, quite frankly, we do still sell about half our grapes. And I hate it every time we do that um, because I know I'm giving great grapes to other winemakers, but they're our friends. And, and in fact, one of them came came back this year who's been buying dust for years and has won a number of very big awards. And and uh, he just sent me a note the other day around some some fruit that we sold him. He says, uh, you, know, you know, his quote was, we're really happy with the fruit quality this year. Some of the best fruit of the vintage yet again. And he actually thanked us for working with him, that uh, he really benefits uh, from being able to use our grapes. Interesting. So I, I, asked, uh, I asked Doug a minute ago about the sort of lessons learned from a Neo perspective. What about from your perspective as the vineyard operator? Um, well, so first off, farm, farm is a system of intelligence, and, and don't get me wrong, a system doesn't replace eyes and ears and feeling on the ground. Um, you need both. Uh, but when we arm our vineyard manager with the data that Neo uh, Labs produces for him, he, he, he has become an entirely different manager of how we look at uh, um, treating our fruit. Uh, but, but beyond that, it's, it, it's really 
you know, a 20 acre vineyard, the soil behaves entirely differently across this vineyard. Um, and you have to know that. I mean, if, if you don't know it, a great example is putting in nutrients. Everyone said put a gallon of water, put in nutrients, put another gallon. In some zones, that's fine. fine. It'll get down to eight inches with three gallons. In other zones, it takes seven. We wouldn't know that without Neo. So, huh. so we have a customized plan for every single zone that we do. And this plant uptake is empowering. Uh, you know how much water the plants are pulling. You know how much stress they're under. Um, and and, and uh, those final bullets, you know, just, just real quickly, soil moisture in and of itself isn't really all that interesting. But soil moisture leads you to field capacity, which leads you to available water content. Those are really, really important. NEO helps determine what those numbers are. Um, and then knowing that water status in real time is, 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 a, you know, is a complete disruption to everybody else who doesn't have this data. Um, we literally can, if you look at our water curves, we are bringing them down to specific depths every single time and watering them right back up to the same level because wow. we have Neil. It's extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. So clearly we've seen some spectacular results at the vineyard. Very, very impressive stuff. And I will continue to talk about that. But before we go too much farther, I want to introduce a special guest who has agreed to join us today. Travis Hagens from Google. Uh, Travis, you are Google's primary contact with Neo Labs, as I recall. That's correct. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, absolutely. So over the past year, I've seen a lot of sort of PR and news and collaboration going on between Google and Neo Labs, including uh, the two of you being in the Google booth at IoT World and fairly prominently displayed at the Google Next 2018. So I guess the obvious question that I want to ask is sort of an outsider looking in here is, you know, why Neo Labs? Because after all, you know, to be, to be perfectly brutally honest here, Google is sort of the, you know, everything in the cloud 100 ton gorilla. So talk to me a little bit about that relationship. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, I would say that's kind of a common mis misconception um, about, you know, how Google Cloud looks at, you know, this entire market. Um, you know, what we really hear from customers is that there's a lot of different use cases and opportunities to really distribute compute and the processing associated with that compute to a number of different places that are really outside of Google Cloud. And really, it's our mission to make sure that through our own products and through our strategic partnerships like the ones we have with Neo Labs, we can really, you know, we can really enable that for our customers. So, you know, a couple examples, you know, within our own products, we have a product called GK, which is essentially it's a managed version of Kubernetes that you can run on top of Google Cloud. So we manage all the underlying work associated with, you know, managing clusters, and VMs, and infrastructure, and really give our customers the ability to to focus more on, on running their building applications and, and, and putting them inside of containers. Now, we've taken that same technology, we've extended it down to, to on-premise. So now you have the ability to, to run that same sort of, um, that same version of Kubernetes on your own hardware and then manage it associated with uh, both, both platforms um, in a single console. So, you know, another example is, is some of the work we've done with, New, with Neo Labs, and they've done a phenomenal job adopting a number of our different machine learning technologies. So, um, you know, Neo has a concept of what's called a Neo block, which essentially makes it very simple to run. Um, now you can run a TensorFlow in that block. So there's a great use case and a number of different times we've seen this applicable where um, you can now take, you know, TensorFlow, which is Google's machine learning framework and technology that we've developed internally. We use it in a number of different, our, our different products that many people on this, on this webinar might, might use today. You can use the back-end horsepower of Google Cloud to build and train a very accurate, very robust machine learning model. You can now take that machine learning model, you can push it down to a very small device that's running uh, one of these Neo blocks, and now the computation associated with that machine learning model, the inference, so making predictions based on that model, it can now be done at the edge. So I think you're going to continue to see us do not only more innovative products um, to help further, again, that mission, but do a lot more with Neo Labs really around not only machine learning, but just distributed computation in general. Very interesting. Thank you. So, so let me just ask you to expand just a little bit, Travis, if you don't mind. So any particular thoughts on how, how the, the sort of Neo Google Alliance, if you will, will enable or accelerate or catalyze digital architecture? Can you say a few more words about that? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, what it really comes down to is ultimately simplicity. And so, um, you know, we have a lot of different tools we have a lot of different things that we provide to our customers and developers. And one of the unique things about what Neo Labs does is that they make using a lot of those tools and integrating with those tools that we have on Google Cloud incredibly simple. Again, so you can push that computation um, where it needs to go. So if, I think if, as you look to um, you know, large organizations, even small organizations that are really looking to, to transform themselves digitally, 
oftentimes that really requires um, a layer of simplicity to be added on top of it so that people can actually go and execute and produce some of the results that you know Phil and the Deep Sky Veneer team have seen. And so I think you know, for us, not only is it, is it that, you know, Neo Labs has, you know, phenomenal technology that can extend many of our cloud services down to an edge device, but it's also about doing it in an incredibly simple way. Very cool. So I, I look forward to seeing the next step of that, uh, of that relationship. I think it's going to be really, really interesting. Uh, thank you for that, Travis, very much. So, Doug, let me come back to you. So this kind of started as an experiment, uh, you know, a fairly tough test for Neo, if you will. So let me ask you, where do we go from here? What's next? Yeah, it really has been in our, our plan has, has always been to really stay patient and improve the product in the field. Um, you know, it'd be great to be able to, to have a SaaS company that, that uh, your customers experiment for you. I don't know how realistic that is, but so we've been really very patient and, and been grinding that experimentation and the lessons learned internally on our own. But so initially, as I mentioned earlier, we got, we got pulled in the excitement about ag and then the experience at at IoT World, then again at, at Google Next. Um, frankly, the market just started screaming at us. The results, the, the absolute quantified results from that have, 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 have forced us to say, look at, we are going to maintain a horizontal platform approach. We are industry agnostic. All of our tools are enabled, have no industry bias. However, just because we've completed the experiment in viticulture doesn't mean we're done. So, uh, you know, announcing today, we are going to go deep into viticulture. We're going to balance a couple of different balls. We're going to balance the horizontal uh, general use uh, industry agnostic model as well as viticulture. So that is coming. You'll be hearing that, that uh, more about that. We're going to start by going into Napa. We have demand there. Uh, we'll be making some announcements. But specifically, the thing that we've had to prove to ourselves is that we could, in fact, get a repeatable tight reference architecture. Now, we're showing you Google uh, integration today, and we'll be expanding on that. But we have pre-built integration into the other popular cloud companies, Microsoft and, and AWS as well. So, um, but without that tight reference architecture, every time you go to any sort of an IoT application, frankly, you're just starting another science experiment. And the market won't bear that. It's already been proven. Uh, the statistics, uh, McKenzie published report on the statistics of people coming out of proof of concept that's really, really very low. So when we go to ag, we're going to go as turnkey as we can get, uh, which means we have to push this scale partner model. Uh, Steve, absolutely have to push it. We know what we're good at. We know what we're not good at. At Deep Sky Vineyard, we did everything. We built our own panels. We sourced every sensor. Uh, we, you know, we, we even pulled fiber and, dry, and, and, and augured holes, as Phil knows. So um, we're going to really be pushing that partnership model and trying to stay in our lanes. And we think that that model can also apply to other industries, um, which we will start to test um, even going into other crops. We have, we have questions and queries around things like row crops and apples, uh, berries, almonds. Um, but again, we're going to try to build a model uh, prove it in viticulture and go into other markets, hopefully like we did with the Asmonsons, where we take a crop, form a lead user, and we go deep on a per crop basis. So, so Neo is officially in the ag business, and you'll be hearing a lot more about that. Good. I mean, I mean, let's face it, Doug, the, the market's going to hold you to that because this yep. is your commitment and it's important, right? Um, the truth is I work with a lot of companies all over the world. I mean, 50 to 70 countries. And what I see most often when I see these kinds of grandiose things is a whole lot of strategic talking that's accompanied by a whole lot of tactical or perhaps operational action. Um, if there's any action at all, right? I mean, Neo started with an idea. It was really an experiment. And during that experiment, you asked one simple question, can this new ecosystem of technologies create human impact? You asked the question, you crafted a response, and now, based on the results we've seen from Deep Sky and others, you know, it's pretty obvious that, that the answer to that is yes. And folks, you're gonna hear more about that in the days and weeks ahead. What I would like to do now is dive, in the remaining time we have, just dive a little bit deeper into the inner workings of the NEO solution for our somewhat more technical audience. Folks, we're not going to bury you with bits here, but we want to give you a little bit more depth. So, Doug and team, if you would put on your Sheldon Cooper hats, uh, <laughs> or is yours. <laughs> 
Yeah, those that, those that, those that know me know I'm about as far from being Sheldon Cooper as, as one can get. But anyway, be that, <laughs> be, be that as it may, you did crack me up. Um, we talked about reference architecture. This is the reference architecture that we're currently using at Deep Sky Vineyard, and we're going to expand on this a bit. Um, this year, we expanded this heavily. Um, what I will tell you is because we, in fact, are cloud agnostic, we were really very, um, very focused on creating a distributed architecture. Um, Deep Sky Vineyard is independent of the cloud. Uh, it has no internet dependency. If the internet is out, the Asmus is going to operate this vineyard. That is very, very critical. Um, as you saw, Wilcox is quite remote. The entire telephony we have available to this vineyard is a 10-3 uh, rural <laughs> SIM card. So it's not like we have a big fat pipe, right? So, um, so we have partitioned through our distributed architecture the ability to use and deploy NEO both locally as well as uh, in the cloud. When we get to the cloud, we take full advantage of Google's tools, um, which we're going to expand on um, here shortly. So um, one of the questions we get asked constantly are questions like which which sensors do you work with? Well, frankly, we don't care. Um, we've even been challenged of taking analog sensors and doing uh, A to D conversion. We really, Neo is agnostic. We currently have, I think it's 212 active, blo active blocks in our block, uh, open, block, open source block repository. Um, so if it produces an output, we can interface with it. Um, so we have uh, functions throughout the vineyard through pump house, valve, and vines. Um, we have sensors at Deep Sky Vineyard, frankly, that we're still experimental. There's controversy around things like dendrometers, but you know it was so simple to use a dendrometer, Steve. That why not? Why you know start to why not to uh, do some experimentation? So um, we we see some companies that try to take a single function like soil tension and build an entire business off of that. That's what I talked about on some of those point solutions. You know, frankly, I, I just don't think that's scalable. Uh, one term that we've gotten from Google loud and clear, I love it, is planet scale. And for the reason we've delayed viticulture and ag in general, because frankly, we didn't feel that we had a planet scalable solution. Today we do. Interesting. Um, same thing when we say we've attacked the challenges. We don't care what the sensors are. We don't care who the manufacturers are. We see some that play well and some that don't. Um, playing well, really meaning around uh, open source protocols or sharing a protocol documentation, things like that. Same thing when we go up a layer into the communication. Um, we, we get a kick out of when we see new solutions launched that say they are exclusively things like LoRa. LoRa is very, very popular today. We love LoRa, but we also know that LoRa is not a universal communications uh, uh, capability. Uh, it, it frankly just doesn't work for all applications. Neo, again, we are agnostic. We've built a, a tool called PubKeeper. We're not going to expand on it, but it is a broker that allows us at Deep Sky Vineyard, as you see, to use a multitude from wired through wireless technologies and protocols. Again, we don't care. We attack the friction. PubKeeper makes, frankly, multi-protocol communication easy, right? So, um, Going in, let's 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 peel down a little bit deeper. We uh, let's go and take a look at the watering event. I'm going to have Jackson join me here. Jackson is the developer of the Deep Sky site. Jackson Rep is sitting here with me in the room. So Jackson, let's 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 go back to the vineyard for a moment. Thanks, Doug. Looks like we are 54% complete. And I wanted to go a little into a little bit more detail about what we do now that we know exactly how much water is going into a particular zone uh, and exactly how well we're allowed to manage uh, those water levels. And you start to get uh, to really in-depth um, data surrounding the results. Um, we talk about yield and we, and we know what that is because we let, uh, we let Phil put it in. So we build a super simple form for him to give us all of the objective measures that we think we can tie back that again, help to inform the algorithm that we, we use to make those watering recommendations. And obviously, these are the recommendations that we built. These are the calculations that we've made. But we can also uh, leverage external tools um, like Google Data Studio. One of the services that's part of this system, in addition to taking the data and putting it in our operational database locally at the vineyard, it pushes data up to uh, the BigQuery um, data store. And then you can access that using uh, using 
Google Data Studio or any other external um, sort of analysis tools. So we've taken a few of those reports and generated them here in Data Studio, and then we incorporate them in UI. There's three right now, but if we needed another one, another metric or another set of data, uh, it takes a couple minutes literally to drag and drop in that tool, and then you can add it to this UI. Yeah, we actually ran a, we had a little bit of a technical glitch at the very beginning on some audio and had to do a reboot. Uh, apologies for that, but we actually were going to build a custom report on the fly for you. We're not going to show off. It, it takes about literally about two minutes and, and Jackson has been using Data Studio for less than a month. So, um, you know, kudos to Google and others that are simplifying, um, you know, data, data analytics and data viz. So um, this, is a, this is something that we're very, very excited. Uh, truth be told, the first two years with the Asmonsons, we were doing a lot of this visualization and analytics the hard way. Um, BigQuery and Data Studio is, is really going to make it simplified. And, and frankly, I'm afraid we're going to really create a beast in Phil Asmundson because he's quite the data hound anyway. So, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's really quite the milestone. I, not to be a broken record, but our, our entire focus as a company is continue to attack the, the, the complexity, right? We all win if users adopt, right? And so as Jackson flies through custom reports and things like that, you know, the, the user needs, they need results, right? And, um, and, and we feel the obligation to, to provide the tools. So Steve, I know we're running a little bit long and we wanted to go a little bit into future state. Um, and then, so I'm gonna, uh, are we good with making a transition there? Absolutely. In fact, why don't we do that? Go ahead and, uh, and sort of give us your thoughts on, on kind of where we're headed because I know you've spent a lot of time looking at that. Yeah, so some of the things that, that we, we feel that we are able to attack now, you know, you've seen us do a real fast flyby on BigQuery Data Studio. Travis mentioned some of the things that we can do with TensorFlow and AutoML and other ML tools, including, you know, non-Google tools, Watson. We have pre-builds for things like that as well. Um, it, we feel now that our ability to, to really distribute machine learning and expand into early, early aspects of artificial intelligence are really before us. So 2019, there are two things that are paramount. Our platform is stable, um, with our tools and our reference architecture is stable. Now what I wanna do is I wanna introduce James Holmes to the Director of Innovation. The other aspect that we're making giant leaps on is what is the edge, right? Now in our world, the edge is what the user needs it to be. So uh, we're gonna play a, a real quick two minute video, I promise it's super short, but we are pushing the boundaries on the edge. Um, we're taking it into things like wearable devices, browsers, mobile phones. So bear with us, we have a, we have a full demo which we can't share with you remotely uh, if you were here we would. So we clipped, uh, James did a quick clip video and um, we'll, we'll be right back to you. Hello. I'm James, Director of Innovation here at Neolabs, and today we're gonna to take a quick look at designing for the dynamic edge. Well, first, what is the dynamic edge? Well, we're surrounded by devices every day, from mobile phones, to microcontrollers, to web browsers, to cloud instances, sort of ubiquitous in our everyday life. However, they don't always play nicely with one another. And this is where the Neo platform can really transform individual devices into a high-performing system. Using Neo, we can dynamically move compute from one side of the edge to the other at runtime. So let's take a look at how this works. Here, we have a simple system. We're gonna collect some information, some data off of some edge devices. We'll do some calculations on that and then render that to an output device. And here we have a collection of everyday devices. We have an Android phone, we have a Raspberry Pi, we have an Android Things microcontroller, we have an Amazon Fire TV, and we have a Google Cloud instance. So first, we're gonna take the bulk of our computation and we're gonna deploy that to our cloud instance. And then we'll take the rest of the pieces and we'll put those on the other devices. And here it is in action. The Neo instance embedded in the Android app has gotten its part of the system and has started running. We can see it sending up data to the cloud. The Raspberry Pi has also gotten its new configuration and it's doing its job sending data up to the cloud as well. Lastly, the UI has also gotten a piece of the system and it's doing its work to collect the information and display it on the screen. 
So now let's say I wanted to remove my cloud dependency. Maybe my connection to the cloud has, has been lost and I can't send data there anymore. Or I don't want to make the round trip, right? I don't want to send the data up to the cloud and send it back down. Or I want to co-locate the data. I want to keep the data close in the same environment and not have to send it up to the cloud in order to be processed. So now I want to take the parts of the system that used to be running in the cloud and distribute them to my edge devices. I'm going to take parts of the system and move them to my front end devices. And I'm going to take other parts of the system and I'm going to move them to my sensor devices and remove the cloud dependency. No longer going to be sending data up to the cloud. They will be communicating peer to peer and they will continue to function normally. So using the Neo platform, you can distribute the workload across all of your devices, whether that's consolidating functionality in the cloud or distributing that across all of your edge devices or anywhere in between. With the Neo platform, you can unlock the potential of all the devices in your system, not just the cloud. And that is designing for the dynamic edge. Yeah, so in a spirit of time, I, you know, I think that both James and I have been, been really imagining the applications for RAG and other horizontals, um, things like, you know, video, you know, every pixel is frankly a data producer within a video stream. Uh, voice, an amazing, an amazing uh, data input, right? So, the uh, we're super excited to um, to push the boundaries in 2019, and and the work that James and team have been doing on the dynamic edge and alternative binaries is really what's what's made us able to go and start to realize a full vision of Neo. Um, with that, we are down to five minutes. We have some really, really, really super good questions. Um, one I'll answer very briefly. We get asked this often is, do we have a rules engine? Well, Neo is the rules engine. Um, we have a, a full contextual build. So uh, rules engines, obviously, were very, a very post-data phenomenon. Put it in a database, put a rules engine against it. Um, so we will expand on that. Um, one thing I do want to offer, we offered this last time we did a webinar, is any users that want to go through a deep, deep, deep technical user experience with us, number one, you, you, you can sign up for a trial license and engage with us one-on-one, -on -one, or just ping us back and we will, get, we will organize a group session. The uh, second question I get is, do we see uh, uh, NEO being, at some point, mandated by the government? Wow, that's a great question. Um, the um, I don't know. <laughs> As a citizen of the planet, uh, I would like it to be. I remember conversations I've had with farmers who will actually say things like, it doesn't matter how much water I use, it's free. And of course, I cringe. Um, we have had government agencies spending a lot of time um, uh, paying attention to us. We've had calls from government agencies. You know, we'll just have to see. I, I don't see it. Uh, frankly, I, I would prefer that not be the case. Uh, I think uh, one week before, I don't want. I shouldn't get political. I almost went there. We we got enough of the government right now, so let's 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 pass on that. Um, <laughs> um, a question we constantly get: Are we exclusive to Google? Um, no, we are not exclusive to Google. We have clients that are using Amazon. We have clients that use IBM. We have clients that use uh, Microsoft. Uh, we really are agnostic. And frankly, I'm going to give. I, I, but I will give Google some props about that. Uh, Google talks and walks the walk of multi-clouding, right? And one of the reasons we are leaning heavier into them at this stage is, in fact, that they have declared to the market that they will always embrace multi-clouding. But now, Neo, the, Neo has no bias. Neo, Neo doesn't need a cloud, which James uh, recently demonstrated, just showed in that video. So, no, we have no bias. Um, people are pressing us for what this cost. Um, like we are trying to make a market, and we, of course, are a company. So uh, as we pull these uh, partnerships together, we'll get better clarity and better granularity about, in this case, cost per acre. Um, so, Steve, I think with that, um, uh, why don't we put a bow on it? We are on the hour and are coming up to the hour. Yep. 
Happy to do that, Doug. Thank you, everyone, for spending the time with us today. I, I just want to remind you that uh, on November 14th and 15th, uh, uh, Phil and Doug will be at Ag 4.0 speaking. So this will be, if you're going to be in the area, be a great chance for you to see them, meet them, press the flesh, and talk a little bit. Second point I want to make is that all of the questions that were asked today in the chat room, even though we didn't have time to get to them live, will be answered and will be sent out. If you have any additional questions, please reach out to the email that you see there on the screen and they will, uh, they will come back to you right away. Um, I just want to close with one kind of final comment. I started out today talking about the third wave. Steve Case said that entire industries are now using technology to transform uh, to transform kind of what they do. And, you know, it's funny, there's a phrase going around the, the greater industry today called digital transformation that's getting a little bit old. We're tired of hearing it. But this is the ultimate example of what digital transformation is all about. Because what digital transformation really is about is about business transformation. It's about using technology to disrupt the way we normally do business because it's the right thing to do. And that is precisely what NEO is doing. So I want to thank everyone that took the hour to spend this time with us and talk a little bit about what, what we're doing. I really want to thank all of our speakers, uh, Doug, Phil, James, Jackson, and of course, Travis from Google. Thank you very, very, very much. Doug, with that, I will stop talking and I'll turn it back to you. No, thank you. I really appreciate your time and, uh, and please, by all means, reach out to us and we, uh, we, keep, we keep our promises. So every question asked, you will receive uh, written answers to. So with that, I will sign off and wish you all a fantastic day. Thank you, Doug.